Hello everyone from wherever you are in the world and thank you for joining us. My name is Louise Hosking, IOSH President-elect, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our series of Thursday webinars. As you know, IOSH, the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, is the chartered body and the world's largest member organisation for health and safety professionals, with over 47,000 members across 130 countries working in nearly every sector. Our vision is a safer, healthier world of work for everyone. This webinar is part of a four part series focused on organisational and personal resilience under the name Caring Through COVID, supporting people and workplaces in the pandemic. The series will run into the new year and IOSH will partner with key organisations to focus on different aspects of this theme. Today, we are happy to welcome the Head of Public Policy at the Chartered Institute of Personal and Personnel and Development, Ben Wilmot, alongside Ruth Wilkinson, who is Head of Health and Safety at IOSH. I'll start by welcoming Ben. He leads the CIPD's public policy team, which works to, to inform and shape debate, government policy and legislation to enable high performance at work and better pathways into work for those seeking employment. And he really does work to um, also champion work and working lives, which I love as well, Ben. So welcome, Ben, to the debate. Um, next, we have Ruth Wilkinson from IOSH. Ruth has been the Head of Health and Safety at the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health since September 2017. Ruth holds a unique position, one that I'm sure none of us would want sometimes, um, fulfilling a health and safety role within IOSH, um, within the Occupational Safety and Health Professional Body. Um, within IOSH, Ruth reports into the Chief Executive and also supports external communication streams. Ruth is also a volunteer in her own time as a member rather than as an employee and supports with category transfer audits, peer review interviews, mentoring and as a technical advisor on content produced for the membership. Ruth also volunteers as a trustee for the Hazards Forum and chairs their technical advisory committee. So let's proceed with today's topic of helping colleagues to stay connected. So a large percentage of people in the UK and elsewhere have been working from home since March and haven't seen colleagues in person for three quarters of this year. Many are familiar with the busy environment of working in offices, on site, traveling from site to site, seeing and interacting face to face with many of our peers and colleagues throughout our working days. But many of these are still working alone from home without having had a change of environment for months, deprived of personal interaction with their colleagues. So we're going to ask today, how are our motivation levels kept at a point where we are still able to be productive, meeting both our social needs and staying engaged with the corporate vision? So, so that's what we're really going to explore today, comparing insights and offering practical suggestions to improve our experiences of remote working and the need to remain connected. So I'm going to jump straight in with the questions and I'm going to come to yourself first, Ben. Um, so, Ben, it appears um, UK employees have largely quite enjoyed working from home this year and that more flexible working arrangements are, are here to stay. Would you agree with this? And if so, do you think working from home has proved to be popular? So Ben, over to you. Yeah, well, um, we've been tracking um, employee attitudes uh, to their working environment over the last sort of six months. Um, and um, our most recent surveys, um, which um, we had results back in uh, September, showed that overall people working from home have um, uh, are more likely to say that they're satisfied with their jobs than people who've continued 
to uh, have to attend the, the physical workplace. And um, we've also found that um, they are <clears throat> they have they're more likely to say that um, that those working from home more likely to say that that their work has had a positive effect on their health um, than those those people who, who are having to uh, or continue to attend the, the physical workplace. Um, and another finding is that they also are more like to say that they are um, kept connected and consulted um, effectively uh, um, through their line manager, which is interesting as well. Um, so, I mean, you know, those are sort of average figures. And of course, they, they hide, you know, the, you know, some of the, the nuance to the picture. But I think what it does show is that, um, you know, for the majority of people who have made this you know, huge shift to home working, um, it has... Um, for many people broadly being, being positive. Um, and we, again, our data suggests that this will lead to, um, beyond the pandemic, this will lead to a step change, uh, or accelerate the step change to more flexible ways of work, including home working. So um, our research showed that um, with employers this time, before the pandemic, employers estimated that on average, about 18% of their workforce work from home regularly. That's at least once, once a week. Uh, but they were then asked, well, wh what proportion of your workforce will work from home regularly after the pandemic, once restrictions are finished? And they they said uh, they estimated on average a, 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 it would be about 37%. So that is a doubling potentially post pandemic. Um, so it does show, I think, that you know this does presage, presage a, a, a step shift. Um, and of course, there are other, other factors behind this, you know, aging workforce as well, which is a longer term driver to. Uh, more flexible forms of working. Excellent. And and Ruth, would you like to add to this? Yeah, thank you, Louise. And um, hi, everybody. I mean, obviously, working from home appeals to people for lots of different reasons and not wanting to cover the ground that Ben's just mentioned. Internally at IOSH with our own members of staff, I mean, we're an, an SME. Um, so when we asked people, what are they liking about the current working arrangements? As you'd probably expect at the top, came flexibility with more work-life balance and other people liked because they didn't have the long commutes saving money on the commute so it does appeal for lots of different reasons but primarily it does support with that work-life balance which we've been talking about for, for some time now but it also demonstrates that activities and ways of working can be done differently and effectively so harnessing technology in different ways looking at more innovation which I can only see will be we'll get more of this going forward and it's probably key to notice that people are liking that hybrid approach they're also wanting to have an anchor point back at the workplace with people as well as having that flexibility to work from home but like Ben said this will continue with us beyond the pandemic in lots of different guises whether it's a hybrid model working from home or you know going back into the office depending on how that work can actually be managed depending on the roles and responsibilities. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, on the there, there is a flip side to all of these things, isn't there, which, you know, I think we're going to explore today, because not everybody has enjoyed working from home. You know, I've certainly dealt with people where, you know, their home setup just, you know, it is never going to be appropriate. Um, so with, you know, work related stress and anxiety issues, we know that that's showing a significant increase. Um, why do you think working from home has led to this, you know, feeling of stress? And I'll come to you, back to you first of all, Ben. Well, I think you've alluded to, to some of the issues. I mean, certainly that issue around, you know, whether people have enough space, whether they've got enough privacy, um, whether they have the right connectivity, you know, those, those were certainly issues. Um, but then there's issues around, um, you know, isolation, loneliness, you know, because I think it's just it's not just the fact that, that people, um, you know, some people miss the workplace and their colleagues. You know, a lot of people um, over the last few months are having fewer social connections in their lives outside work. So if you combine that, you know, people, have, some people are feeling extremely isolated, which has been exacerbated by working from home. I think another factor is potentially workload as well. I think, um, you know, it's. Um, you know that that fatigue of um, although you know, in lots of ways you know we're very lucky to be able to work from home but um, the flip side can be you know very early starts very late finishes um, you have fewer breaks 
um, you know, does, it's potentially hard to step away, you know, at least when you leave the office, you know, it's easier to sort of say, oh, well, that's, I've done my work today. But um, so I think that issue around workload, how we manage workload and um, is, is crucial as well. Mm -hmm. Ruth, do you want to add to that one? Yeah, I suppose just um, probably adding to the conversation, we've normally when you go through any change management there's consultation there's incremental change to working from home these things don't happen overnight but for all of us back in March in the UK it did we were moved to home working quite quickly and rapidly and as, as you've mentioned we've we've gone to a place of working from home where we may not have had the equipment set up for that but in the normal way where people do work from home you'd have gone through that process made sure people were equipped and there's also the unknown factors aren't there there's the how long is this going to happen can we go back keeping up to date with the changes in guidance so it's a dynamic situation which needs to be dynamically risk risk assessed so that there's lots of factors for for different people and bringing on going back to sort of Ben's point really that Although people have said they're liking this greater flexibility with work and home, it just means that that person's day is packed with one thing or another. So fitting in the work around the family commitments, caring commitments, homeschooling, if we've got self-isolation going on or certain lockdown that we had at the start. So that there is a lot for individuals to juggle rather than having that compartmentalization that we might have had previously mm -hmm. so we, we've got a multitude of factors that are going on that are multi-causal for individuals as they coupled with the key bits of isolation and the support networks that as individuals we have you know we can't just pop out and see our friends or family at the moment so it's it's not just the work situation it's that the combination of being in in this situation at the moment yeah, it's that kind of lack of change, I think, isn't it? I never thought that I would miss traveling between, um, you know, customers and work and presentations and being on a packed tube, but it's kind of happened a little bit. So um, just moving on, um, this is something that, you know, massively um, intrigues me and I'm really interested to hear your take on this um, coming to you first full Ben. So um, Deutsche Bank has suggested that employees who continue to work at home post pandemic should have to pay a 5% daily tax to help lower paid workers who are unable to work from home. Um, and from your perspective, I'm just wondering, Ben, you know, how you see this as an as a as a potential initiative? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure it's been fully thought through, to be honest. Um, I think one of the one of the issues is that, you know, um, you know, it seems to make the assumption that people working from home are, you know, earning um, more than average. And, you know, that um, but we know that that is not necessarily the, the case across the piece. It might be a, a overall. But if you, you know, that we've probably got about half the UK working population um, who are currently working from home and many of those will will be in, in at the sort of low end of, of the wage spectrum um, so you know I, I really don't think that a sort of five percent tax across anyone who works from home um, you know has to really take into account the the sort of whole the huge range of people um, who will be working from a pop from having a whole range of different jobs and sectors it's level of seniority so I and I think but the, the other point is that you know I don't um, it sort of penalises um, uh, home working, and um, you know we have, as, as I mentioned before, that you know, there is a um, beyond the pandemic. The the other you know huge um, trend uh, demographic shift is our ageing workforce, and increasingly you know we will need working arrangements that suit people who um, have um, have fluctuating health conditions. Um, who you know, they, there will be an increased um, proportion of people who, who have uh, caring responsibilities, and so we should be trying to support um, the um, the provision and uptake of flexible working arrangements, of which home working is one and not the only one. And we might come on to the other, you know, sort of issues around home work, work flexible working. But I think so for a whole range of reasons, the idea that we should be sort of um, punitively taxing home workers, um, uh, I think, probably doesn't make sense. And I mean, there's also going to be, you know, some work activities that can never be undertaken from home. So, you know, construction work, if you're um, delivery, logistics, you know, retail care, which we've all relied so much on, um, you know, essential industries. And 
Ben, can you can you see this kind of creating a friction? Will yeah, you... I think this this is a this is a real risk at the moment. And I, I mean, I think going back to some of the data I was highlighting at the beginning of um, the discussion, you know, the fact that at the moment people who are working from home have higher levels of job satisfaction. Um, uh, on average than, than people who are going to the physical workplace. And of course, COVID is, is a context for that. But I think longer term, we've got to ensure that um, you know, there is choice around flexible working arrangements. And of course, home working is just one of those. But so for people, you know, in um, those sorts of roles, which you mentioned, you know, but there are other forms of flexible working, you know, things like um, job share, annualized hours, term time working, compressed hours working, you know, the uh, flexi time there's lots of ways of providing flexibility um but what what we're finding at the moment what our research is showing at the moment is that employers are absolutely thinking about how they can embed and support the shift to more home working they're not thinking about that wider flexible working agenda and i think that is the danger that we will have the sort of haves and the have nots those people who can work flexibly mainly working from home and those who um, are really having to you know, could go down the more traditional, uh, attend the workplace nine to five, you know, to generalize, but to make a point. Um, so I think that 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 two tier workforce is a is a real challenge. And I think that's why there needs to be a real push, um, both from government around policy of, on flexible working and on employers to look at the other forms of flexible working and how they can make sure that flexible working is inclusive across the workforce. Yeah, and there's so many, you know, ben, it, 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 there's so many benefits, you know, one of the things I've always said is that part time work and flexible work shouldn't be part of the career. Um, and, you know, if you think of a director's role, even at that kind of level, that's a massive job. And why can't it be a job share, you yeah. know? let's start thinking outside the box on these things. Yeah, um, I think the thing about job share, you know, quite often it's seen as um, well, it's you know it's quite difficult because you've you know you've got to get the right match you know mm -hmm. issues around um the how you recruit and you know how you manage um people who are job share but actually if you look at it from a positive perspective you know you bring um two um people together you combine talents and aptitudes um you support retention of of um you know talented people in the workplace you support inclusion um, and opportunity within the workplace so i think you know we've got to start thinking differently about about um flexible working arrangements yeah brilliant and um coming to you ruth because you know you've you've got i know you work with lots of teams <laughs> and um you know it is the question of motivation so i think you know we didn't all of us expect to be where we are right now for this period of time you know and keeping teams motivated especially if you've you know taken new members of your team on perhaps in in this you know i've got people that i work with who've said well i've never seen my colleague in person um ruth you know in terms of motivation how have you sort of kept people connected and motivated yeah, it's 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 a good question, and um, it's one that I suppose as we all moved to going to, to this model quite quickly, that we we needed to jump on very you know quickly to respond and react to, and at the very start of our journey, as I mentioned, we did do a survey to capture how people were feeling, you know, ask for statements, how do you rate yourself, so we could get a feel for what was going on, and also to rate some of the activity <clears throat> that we had done until that point to see how that was going down, you know, do we do more of some things and less of other things, and um, sort of fast forward just to a couple of weeks ago, actually, we've revisited our engagement score, and it's actually gone up, so we're really pleased with that internally, and, and obviously it's the support of everybody that's gone on within IOSH, of how we do this and so if I just touch on some of those areas where we initially had a comms plan so I kind of look at communications as being you're pushing out that information but it's not just the push is it it's the engagement so identifying what engagement means to your organization how do you do it how do you keep people engaged you know the measured approach to information there's also that key bit of also personal responsibility you know what information do you need to equip colleagues with in order to make that informed decision and you know sort of guide them down that journey um social response sorry the social interactions are also key so we were fortunate that we've got our employee forum to support and lead on 
peer-to-peer -peer support. Now, as part of our health and wellbeing strategy, it was always something we wanted to get to for peer-to-peer -peer support rather than the organisation delivering X, Y, Z. So COVID was actually a bit of a, a catalyst to kickstart this a little bit more. And the employee forum um, have been great. We've got different things to support active, you know, physical exercise interaction on a social level um, from book clubs we also had had an awards ceremony yesterday which is more of a let's just get people together and have a bit of fun and recognize the efforts everybody's put in this year and that went down really well good timing for this time of the year um i suppose we've also as an organization if i come back to the organizational response we refined priorities from the outset so rather than going into the covid response with all of the priorities and the work streams and the bau that we were doing to say right we know there might be an impact on resource people also from a mental health perspective where can we you know which are the key priorities of the business we need to focus on and you're very clear the leadership team are committed they're you know they're the visual and they're obviously channeling these priorities so everybody knows and can see where their role fits into so they've got the clarity of role the demands of the work are also being looked at and considered so so i suppose in, in response louise it's that collective collective response collective controls across all avenues from two-way feedback leadership commitment that's visible you know, managers as well, sorry, managers having good, meaningful conversations, being equipped with the knowledge to have those conversations and to talk about what they need to, so that health, safety and well-being is part of that performance discussion. I mean, it should have been anyway, but it's kind of really embedding that. So if you need to build that rapport and understand an individual, because recognising signs and symptoms that somebody might be struggling is not as easy when you're not seeing them across that seven hour shift. So it's how do you um, enable managers to have those conversations, teams to hook up, have that support. So it's not a one size fits all or there's not one magic solution. It's you have to put effort, effort in across lots of different domains to get people involved. Yeah, that's brilliant. So which kind of brings us on to more of the conversation about um, culture, really. Um, and Ruth, you mentioned, you know, you've both mentioned it, this massive, you know, we went into this and we've had this massive rate of change that's pushed on comfort zones no matter where you are in an organization um, and there's going to be people that are listening into this from a range of sectors and all sizes of businesses so you know how has this sort of panned out in terms of, of, of overall business culture we love talking about culture don't we so I'm going to ask Ben for you to just talk about that from a general perspective and then perhaps Ruth you can come in and talk about it from a purely sort of health and safety perspective so Ben first of all. I mean I, I think um, you know what what the pandemic has done is is you know it's shone a light on um, the workforce and and how the workforce the, the importance of valuing um, and investing in in your workforce I think from a culture perspective um, you know, what lies at the heart of, of a positive um, culture is uh, the employment relationship um, and the extent to which that is uh, based on trust and mutual respect. And um, critical to that is uh, the role of the line manager. And, and I think, um, I mean, Ruth touched on this, but I think this, is, um, this has really come through as I think, you know, we've, we've talked quite a lot um, you know, in recent years about the importance of, 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 of management, but actually what's come through very clearly is the importance of people management. You know, line managers um, from the top to the bottom of, the bit of, of an organisation, having the, um, the knowledge and understanding the behaviours that support um, uh, people with the, um, uh, that they manage. And we've done quite a lot of work, work on, on this, looking at um, the, the behaviours that help to prevent and manage stress, um, and the behaviours that support motivation and commitment and um, uh, to, to the organisation and the, broadly we've what, what, the, the sort of five broad areas that are critical. Um, so the first is you know, how you turn up as, as a leader, you, you know, how you role model behaviours. So do you um, do you um, 
uh, manage your emotions? Do you not not pass on stress? Are you accessible to people? Um, um, do, you, do you treat people fairly? Um, do you act with integrity? And then the, the second area is around um, you know, how you proactively manage problems. So, you know, issues around conflict or health and well-being or absence, you know, you need to, as a as a line manager, um, you you um, you can't wait in you know, issues unless you you manage issues promptly, they escalate. Um, and so it's really how you how how you manage and um, deal with problems. Um, and the, the third element is um, the sort of classic, you know, how you guide, communicate, um, how you provide um, clear objectives, constructive feedback. Um, and the fourth area is around um, knowing the individual. And I think this is so crucial now that, you know, uh, particularly in COVID, you know, we know that COVID has affected people in so many different ways, depending on their gender, their age, you know, their, their, the type of job they do, whether they've got caring responsibilities. As a manager, you need to know the people that you manage as individuals. You need to care about them. Um, and because that's when people only open up to you um, if they if if they think that you they, that you care about them, and so you you really should start to know the people you manage as individuals. You know, do they have, um, you know, you know what do, do they have a family? You know, do they have you know? You start, need to start to, to understand them as individuals, um, and that that will help you build that 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 trust, which as I said is, is at the heart of of, of positive organisational cultures. And the final bit is around, you know, how you support development, people's development and career aspirations and coach and develop on the job. So our, our research shows, shows, you know, that those behaviours uh, have, be have come to the fore as being critical, particularly in terms of how you manage remote workers, um, but, but all workers. I mean, I th and, and the other thing is time. You, as a manager, you have to invest time in building these relationships. You should be having regular, you know, weekly one-to-ones with, with people, um, and that time spent will, will be paid back in terms of more efficient, more productive and, and happier teams. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the things that's coming through strongly. We have to invest in how we uh, train and support our line managers uh, to manage people properly in a human way. Yeah, thanks. And just, you know, we can't have, you know, a positive culture within an organisation generally leads to a, a positive health and safety culture and I think vice versa so thinking about it from an OSH perspective um Ruth um you know what have been the challenges do you think that organizations to sort of keep their positive health and safety culture going you know and and probably like myself you know I didn't come into this job to get behind a desk and I seem to be doing an awful lot of it you know when's the best time for us to go back and start auditing and checking and you know how do you think this has affected health and safety culture yeah I mean as you mentioned Louise I suppose if I just start at the outset we've said health and safety culture is a subset of the wider organizational culture and within our profession we're always striving for that positive culture so it's that mixture of the attitudes values beliefs and obviously looking that informs an individual's behavior so we're already on this journey of culture and as you say we us in our profession through the through the organizational activity to date culture's up there for us and when with this shift working differently we've not necessarily got our systems set up um, to respond and communicate and and work in this way and as you say in the roles that we do part of that is we're not a desk-based role we're normally out and about observing supporting knowing what's going on responding where we need to so so there is an element and a shift in what's going on and changes likewise if priorities have changed it's, it's just it's just a whole change management piece at the moment so if we sort of think about culture being that collective of everybody there obviously I know our organization we've had new starters we've had leavers so that in itself is is a challenge you know you're building up a culture with individuals training informing briefing them you know supporting them and you get new people in so it's how are we <clears throat> consistently and able to manage to fulfill that function so even from the employee's journey coming in and we've moved remotely as I guess lots of other people has it as you've alluded to they're meeting teams and colleagues virtually on different platforms so but 
from the from a strategic process to, um, process to it, it's it's a bit of what Ben said as well. It's still relative for health and safety, but you still need that leadership commitment to health and safety. So again, within our organisation, that response to COVID and also the response to the new ways of working has put firmly as our primary focus, the health, safety and the well-being of our staff. So our employees are at the heart of our agenda. They sit in our our values and behaviour framework anyway, also as does health, safety, well-being. But even in this current state of play, I mean, we've recognised people are working from home. All of this is going on about the health, safety, well-being. So our efforts and resources are lined there for the here and now, but also thinking about actually we will be retaining some of this. So what are the new ways of working? And from our systems, what do we need to review? So there's an organisational development piece strategically, <clears throat> which obviously health and safety fits in. How are we going to ensure people are inducted, competent for their role? Do we do this virtually going forward? Will they come in to do certain things face to face in the future? How do we keep that connection and engagement? How are we measuring that some of this works? So so really your systems, you need to have a look and make sure are your risk assessments up to date. Are they communicated to people? You know, if people are working from home, have you got this covered from a risk assessment perspective? You might have your COVID secure risk assessment at the workplace, but what about those who are at home? Have they been briefed and informed and trained on how to set up workstations in this temporary normal? So it's, it's looking at everything through that plan, do, check, act, methodical process, and just making sure that they're fit for purpose. And as you said in your introduction, Louise, that, I've got that responsibility for IOSH's members of staff. So myself and a colleague are reviewing all of our processes with that sort of COVID lens to make sure that with what we're doing now, everything is covered. And this will also future proof for that new normal. And all of this will collectively help shape that culture. So keep embedding health safety into all those policies and practices, not just health and safety ones, but through procurement strategies, people agendas, you know, we need to get it in there. So it just becomes what we do and think of. And because um, people are at the heart of delivering the activities, aren't they? So it's it's been a little bit more flexible and innovative of how we, we do this in the current climate to answer your question, Louise, and thinking of future proofing going forward as well. So, so as a you know, as a head of health and safety, um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, reviewing risk assessments is probably something everybody's doing at the moment, because, you know, we're going to, we've got to live with this even for a little while while we've got the vaccine, but how do you decide when it's time to get out from behind the desk as a health and safety professional, because, you know, we need to see these things going on, so... You know, yeah. and, and, you know, particularly depending on what sector you're in, that might vary. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, as we, if we sort of go back to the, the systems review, obviously the plan do the check and act. We've still got to do the check and acting. And mm -hmm. I've noticed that some people have gone into more of a virtual audit. So, again, if that is satisfactory, then that could work for some organisations, depending on the risk profile. There will be some activities that are more high risk <clears throat> safety critical for which somebody would need to go in and in which case if you need to have that presence my recommendation would be just exactly what you just said Louise really it's we need to risk assess our own activities we need to be leading by example which means following the laws of the land at that particular time and, and the guidance what's going on are, are there restrictions in that area on that sector that particular you know area what's going on so I think it is that informed decision and doing that assessment approach, but there will be different nuances here, really. So following our hierarchy of control, do we need to? Can we do it virtually so everybody's kept safe? If you get to that essential remit, then, of course, and, um, and I suppose moving forward, we just need to be led by things that are changing at the moment you know depending on the workplace might influence whether some of us get back to more active physical presence on site um, but we just need to keep up that review and monitoring which is part and parcel of our nature of how we we operate anyway so it's it's monitoring all of that but we've got to do the check and acting we're, we're looking at our systems we're changing it 
if we don't have these assurance measures in place, how can you assure yourself that they're actually working and people are connected, motivated, engaged, informed, being productive? It's it's coming up with the right solution for the risk profile and your nature of the work. I, I love that. You know, I love what you said about the fact that we've got to risk assess ourselves. Um, and I think that's really important as well from, you know, uh, but the potential, you know, we've been talking about mental health awareness. Um, you know, and while we're busy being busy and supporting the rest of the business, we've got to consider ourselves as well. Um, and I think there is a right time for us to go out and about because health and safety, all the other types of health and safety does not stop. Um, so at some point we've got to do that. But I love what you I think that's a really great message is that we need to reflect on our own health and safety. Um, and that might be an active choice that we have to stop and make in all of this. Well, everybody's, you know, got so much on their plate. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, it's great. I think a lot of um, our probably mutual members are really delighted that we've got this session with CIPD and IOSH on here. Um, so coming to you, um, Ben, first of all, um, I mean, obviously our Personally, I feel like I've been dealing with my HR colleagues so much more this year. Um, but, you know, how can our members um, work, work together more? How can we, you know, collaborate um, as, you know, individuals, membership body? You know, what can we get out of, of doing more together, I guess, is the question, Ben. Um, I mean, I think it's, um, it's really understanding um the uh where where the sort of the value is around you know um coordinating and working working together and i you know i think it, and again this does come back as well to you know how hr um supports line managers so they they understand their role so you know obviously you know managers can help hopefully create a, a positive uh, working environment and help to um, manage and mitigate against stress through how they through the, how they manage people hopefully in a in a in a positive way but um they've got to understand the you know that um there's a real value in terms of for example early early uh, referral to occupational health services um and um at what point that you know that that it makes sense to, to rather than sitting on a problem um you know we know that for example um you know, some problems like um uh, you know, de depression or, you know, um, uh, musculoskeletal conditions, you know, they tend to be either recurrent or long term. So, you know, they, that's when uh, managers should be referring, um, you know, quickly to, to HR and, and, and of course, to occupational health um, for um, so that so the timely intervention, um, you know, can, can happen and people can be referred to uh, expert support and um, given help when, you know, to help them. Um, uh, recover and, and re rehabilitate, um, for example. At the, so I think it's it's really understanding um, and educating um, uh, managers and making the case as well for uh, you know, why why investment in in occupational health is so critical. And of course, you know it's it's relatively easy in some large organisations that will have their own occupational health um, uh, department. But, but you know we know that many many small firms um, don't. Of course, and they, they they don't know where to go to get support, you know, in the market. So I think that's a real challenge as well. And so, highlighting, you know, educating um, managers so that they really understand the value um, of of uh, occupational health um, and safety, um, I think is is where we can make a a, a big difference over time. Yeah, right. And Ruth, same question for you: How we can work together more? Yeah. Um... I mean, I'm just thinking when I, my, my previous role eight years before I joined IOSH, I actually had responsibility of health, safety, well-being. So I supported, worked very closely with HR. Likewise, at IOSH, worked very closely with the people team. Um, I'm currently line managing that team at the moment. So the synergies are very clear operationally and strategically sort of corporately for me. I mean, there's, if I just touch on, areas of interest we've already talked about culture so I won't go back on that but culture we've got key interests we need to get Osh in there in that wider organizational culture 
we obviously align on so many different areas because we're all about the people function. So we're all about looking after health and safety of the individual, obviously the well-being, the mental health aspects in there, likewise for colleagues in sort of CIPD. So we've definitely got an arena, an agenda that's of interest there, but also at various points through the employee's life cycle from recruiting them are they fit to do that activity are there any health and safety impacts do they need reasonable adjustments so and obviously what health and safety can bring as well is that prevention piece to what's going on in the workplace is there work sorry is there work related health problems that we need to look at preventing are there just actually health issues that are going on that we can help support that person to work come back to work sooner so I definitely see the the complementary piece of just supporting and including people in that workplace to to undertake that role safely. So, so, so for me, it covers all of those grounds and obviously building on those relationships. And as Ben said, really, if we look at the manager's role within it, they're sort of sit nestled in the middle of the leaders setting the direction, colleagues delivering the actual activities and the work. How can we support managers? So there's definitely a management focus there for me, but just generally that complementary piece of supporting people in that workplace because we bring lots of different spheres to it and avenues. And for me, definitely in my role, I can't see them working independently and, they, and I haven't seen them working independently they're very much cohesive on certain avenues yes HR have got certain remits which we don't dip into but actually when you look at the crux of supporting somebody to work then the two most certainly sort of meet in the middle yeah and I think it is it, it's part of the communication that's probably improved I think um, that probably we have a greater understanding. So that's great. I'm going to start um, taking some questions from the Q&A. So thank you for um, bringing those in. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Chris Stracy, um, and sort of tie this in with a question of my own, really. So he says, or she, at the moment, working from home is enforced and therefore more difficult to deal with. Whereas after the pandemic, if employers allow employees who don't wish to work from home, will be able to choose where they work, where they work. So I guess, you know, what Chris is saying is as we come out of this, there could be a potential conflict between the employer and the employee in respect of where they work and how that's dealt with. Um, ben, so could you, could I give you that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the key really is choice. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, employers should be moving to working arrangements that are designed to support, to, to, to fit with the individual wherever possible, wherever the business allows. Um, and um, you know, that issue around, around choice will be critical to, you know, I mean, once, you know, obviously, um, people are ready in the current environment are extremely worried about their job security they're worried that if they do leave the job they, they won't find another one as good or, or it'll, they'll be um it'll be very difficult to find a job so um probably in this environment um you know it'll be um the, the power is you know very firmly with uh with employers and, and to some extent people will probably you know if if employers um are short-sighted and they they want to just um you know, dictate where where people should work then I imagine in the short term um, people will just have to you know put up with that but actually longer term um, you know I think um, as the as the economy when the economy rec recovers um, you know those those people who um, you know who who feel that their employer um, is not um, doesn't care about their their preferences or their you know the challenges that they might face about having to work in a very prescriptive way they will vote with their feet they will they will leave and and so I think the you know I said before the the big trends like aging workforce will, will mean that employers will have to provide more choice to individuals um, over the long term um, and and we know as well that um, that's correlated with you know greater levels of job satisfaction engagement motivation etc so I think it's um, hopefully that will help to drive well, you know, more flexible inclusive arrangements which are more designed around the the needs and choices of individuals yeah we we you know in health and safety we always talk to, when we talk about ergonomics 
we always talk about you know making sure that the work is fitted around the person and, it, and it's just an extension of that really isn't it so yeah so, so yeah one for you Ruth um do you believe that the increasing levels of home working will be reflected in changes to legislation and or guidance in the future and that's from Jeff Lawson and a couple of um attendees have responded to that as well yeah I mean through the health and legis health and safety legislation we've got at the moment obviously it's not we haven't got prescriptive direction on working from home but there is enough flexibility in there to cover work activities and ensuring the health safety and welfare of employees and non-employees through activities so obviously working from home isn't new we have got information out there thinking about ourselves um, in England here and from the HSE we've got guidance on working from home we've got the overarching bit through the health and safety at work act the management regulations for risk assessment so we've got that piece covered I suspect we'll probably get reviewed guidance going forward if this becomes more of the norm. Obviously, I'm not in a position to be able to confirm that that will definitely be the case. But from a legislative starting point at the moment, it's already covered through what I've already mentioned. We've got the DSC regulation, so we know how workstations should be set up. So it's, it's a further extension. So that would be my advice, go and have a little look what's there at the moment. But I would suspect that some of those areas will probably be due a bit of a review if this becomes more of a norm, um, which I suspect it will be as we've talked about. Yeah, so one of the um, questions um, that's in the panel here today, so from um, this one's for you, Ben, from Sue Porter, um, um, and it might be one for you as well, Ruth. Should um, companies provide us with liability insurance for work from home? So I don't know if that's a question that you can comment on, Ben, in terms of, you know, home equipment and what's going, you know, what, in terms of equipment that people have got at home and so on? Um, to be honest, um, it's not really my uh, liability insurance um, uh, isn't really my area of expertise. Ruth, um, jump in so I'll probably, I'll probably <laughs> pass that on if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for any insurance provider, as you know, we, we need to make sure we have our EL, PL as necessary. And through conversations with your insurance provider, it's definitely... It's, it's important that you flag what activities are being undertaken. So if there are any changes, it can all have an impact on your insurance. So if you are suddenly going more to a work from home model rather than in the office, then it's, it's, it's important that you flag this to ensure that you've got the necessary cover. Exactly the same as if you've got people traveling around either domestically in cars or flying to different areas. All of this needs to be covered off in the insurance so the insurer can advise you accordingly so I would definitely recommend that you ensure that you're covered yeah and there's lots of questions um that are coming through in the chat box about work-related stress and how people are sort of seeing changes in respect of that um I mean Ben it, it was a difficult thing for us to manage beforehand and you know faced with you know all of this at the moment you know from I'm going to ask the same question to both of you um from a, a from your perspective Ben and then from your perspective Ruth where do you start with this if an organization hasn't really looked at it where do they start well it's interesting it's a really interesting uh, area um you know we know that under the um the health and safety at work act and the management of health and safety at work regulations um, there is a duty on employers to um, to risk assess for, um, for you know for, for, for uh, health and well being both to, uh, to to look at you know the physical risk but also the, the risks of, around um, people's mental health at, at work and um, so in theory there is a duty to you know to ensure that your your risk assess covers work related stress and we know from our surveys that actually you know probably less than half of employers actually do meet their, you know, what would be their obligations in, in that area. We know that, you know, back in sort of 2000, between 2000 and 2010, the, or 2008 anyway, the, the, the health and safety executive was really looking at this issue around, um, it was, you know, starting to train its ins inspectors to be able to, uh, to, to uh, inspect 
for um, work-related stress. Um, and then, you know, there was the financial crisis, um, very, very significant changes to the health and safety executive. Um, and although the health and safety executive is, you know, their, their team is very interested in work-related stress at the moment, um, there's, there's no new real um, push to um, really enforce you know, those existing requirements on employers. So I think um, it might be, it'd be interesting to see whether um, this, the, issue, you know, the issues that have, have come to the fore as a result of the pandemic lead to a renewed focus on work-related stress. And, and you know, given that the risks in the workforce um, are you know, increasingly becoming weighted towards the psychological, you know, does there need to be a real rethink around you know, how we manage um, health and safety in the workplace over time? Um, really interesting area to discuss, I think. And it's definitely an area for both our disciplines as well. And Ruth, just yeah. yeah. And um, and, and you're right, as you'll you'll know, Louise. Obviously, Ben's already mentioned we've got the extension through the Health and Safety at Work Act, our management regs for risk assessment, and we've got legal precedents that have been set through common law case law for stress in the workplace, particularly around risk assessments. If somebody's presented and known, you know that there's requirements there to make sure risk assessments are in place, action is taken. Um, and as Ben's just mentioned, it's just the signpost, HSE have got the management standards on this. There are the six risk factors, starting with things like demand, relationships. So that's a very good spot starting point. I've actually enhanced that internally to make it more of a well-being assessment so you can bring in individual factors as well. So you can bring in where there might be other impacts to, to the individual, which is an important part of risk assessment. So we're not just looking at the work-related aspects, but the, the holistic picture, because Ruth that walks through that door or works virtually at the moment is the same Ruth with everything going on, as well as the work-related factors. So that would be the starting point. Have a look, come up with a process that works, but you can't ignore the individual factors as part of risk assessment. It'll impact their health, their productivity, their morale, their engagement. So if you want to get the best and to support individuals it's having these good open honest conversations and as Ben said earlier on understanding people just from basics of who to live with you know what's going on in their their world and how can we support to support them to work to get the best always absolutely so I'm gonna um it goes really fast doesn't it this hour I know so just, just as a, a kind of wrap up I'm going to come to both of you is you know there have been positives that have come out of this just as a as a really short couple of sentences you know what is the key positive for you that we can take forward from this conversation and into 2021 Ben you first of all I'll, I'll do two very quickly. So, so f first of all, I think, you know, um, the pandemic has shown that people can be trusted to work from home. You know, it's busted the myth around, around you know, the fact that people have to be present in, in the workplace in, in order to, to, to perform. So hopefully that will um, support, you know, some, some longer term change around how we think about flexible working arrangements. Secondly, as I said before, I think it's highlighted um, in the incredibly important crucially important role of the line manager. Um, at the moment, I think we've got about 40% of line managers um, have, have received training to manage people. Um, you know, we need to see that double to 80%. You know, people should not be managing people um, unless they're given the, the training and guidance and support to enable to, to, to conduct that role effectively. Absolutely, and we've done research in IOSH that has backed that up as well. And Ruth, last comment from you all right i'm gonna do my best a couple of sentences very short short and sweet i think it's been great for the role of the osh professional and also the importance of occupational safety and health um, in the first instance you know it really has put us there valued credible professionalism how we can link into and support people to work in the workplace with the current pandemic and public health and everything else sort of going on it's been great it's raised mental health psycho psychological risk and health impacts as well um, and just also the discipline multidisciplinary approach you know the interactions that we have with HR colleagues facilities business continuity um, procurement it's across the board isn't it so again they are kind of some key key areas for me to take away 
That's fantastic. I am going to just finish with one last comment from Gaynor Danks, actually, on the Q&A. And I could carry on with this all day as well. And I'm going to literally read um, what Gaynor said. So I think many of the health and wellbeing issues are related to how management, HR and health and safety all work together to inform gain trust and confidence as well as inclusion where possible. For our staff seeing our equipment on TV when Nightingale hospitals were being opened and last night our syringes being used to give COVID-19 vaccinations gave them an amazing boost. Their hard work has paid off. We find with the staff of 100 we have been able to keep everyone in the loop of where they are is, is essential and their feedback has molded our strategies throughout consultation breeds buy-in and I think that's a great way to finish um, the session so I'd love to carry on and answer the rest of the questions and I'm sorry if I haven't reached your question um, but I'd like to just express a massive thank you to um, Ben and Ruth our panel today um, as we said this is the second webinar in our four-part series caring through covid and our next webinar is planned for the 14th of july 2021 which is entitled keeping in touch with our creativity so on behalf of iosh i'd like to wish our members an enjoyable safe and restful christmas break um, and a happy and healthy new year um, but also remembering um, that this can be a time that means different things to different people um, and it's not going to be the same this year. Um, being a member of IOSH means that you are not alone, you're part of a community, so please do stay connected. Um, talk to people, talk to us on social media or via your groups or net networks. Um, Health and safety has been under an amazing spotlight this year and, you know, all of our members have totally knocked it out of the park. So here is to a very different 2021. Um, if you're not a member of IOSH, um, we would be delighted to tell you more. So um, please do become part of our global community and visit us at IOSH.com, um, which goes without me saying once again thank you Ruth, Ben and to everybody on the call today um, and I think we've practically kept everybody on so thank you so much stay safe and I will see you in 2021 thank you